Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper. Today we're going through some leadership interview tips. Now I have both interviewed people for leadership positions and I have interviewed for leadership positions. So I know a lot in this area and I can't wait to share these tips with you. Let's get started. All right, so we've gotten several requests for some leadership interview tips. We do have a few videos and I'll link them up here, but I wanted to go through and just do some quick overarching tips that you can use right now because many of you are going in for leadership position interviews so you can start the new school year as an assistant principal so this is very exciting now some of you may have to go through a leadership pool interview which is what i had to do which is kind of a step before the actual interview with the principal so for bigger school districts a lot of times candidates will have to go and interview in front of a panel and then if they are accepted by that panel then they move into the pool or they're allowed to interview then with individual principals. Other people in smaller districts or other districts, after you're done taking your leadership exam and you have your master's in educational leadership, you are then qualified enough to go and interview with principals. Either way, the techniques today are going to help you with both of those types of interviews. All right. The key thing I want you to remember when thinking about the interview is that you should be using building level leadership experiences. So you want to get out of the classroom and get into the building as a whole or the district. Now, some of you have more experience in this than others. Some of you completed an internship. You got a lot of experience at the building level. Maybe you helped with the construction of a new school with the principal. That's a really great leadership experience. Or maybe you were able to shadow a principal or work directly with a principal. Maybe you took over discipline for a while for your leadership internship or instruction and curriculum all different types of things. Or you could be one of those people who had a principal who didn't really pay much attention to you and you didn't get the leadership experiences that you really need. Don't worry, either way you can pull from any experience. Now, if you've been a coach, you definitely have leadership experience because you're not only leading your students, but you're leading parents and the community. So keep that in mind. If you coach any type of sports, you're definitely going to be able to pull from those, especially if you ran big fundraisers. I know a lot of uh, football coaches and, and golf coaches and things like that and cheerleading coaches who had to do these huge fundraiser events. Those are a big deal and definitely can be a part of your leadership skills that you pull from from this. Um, but even if you didn't coach, you can still do it. If you were a teacher in the classroom and you worked in a PLC with other teachers, you helped make department level decisions, um, any type of thing where you were out of your classroom, maybe you were on the textbook committee and you helped to pick a new textbook for your content area, you worked with teams, all of that stuff is leadership experience. So don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna pull from a few different things there, even if you weren't a coach or don't have those tangible leadership experiences that are you know most common in this situation. And then of course, if you led any type of professional development or helped to, you know, convey any kind of professional development to the staff or to other teachers, that's a big one. Leading other teachers in professional learning is a really good experience to use while you are working on this interview. All right. So I'm going to go through three specific questions that you may or may not be asked. It doesn't really matter. I don't know what the principal is going to ask you, but I do know there are some overarching questions that are probably going to be there. And I'm going to show you how to pull from different areas that you may have that you can answer these questions in. The other thing I want you to be mindful of is that not everything has to be a huge success. People who are interviewing for leadership positions are often overachievers. And yes, I'm talking to you. I'm sure that you were very diligent in your master's level work. I'm sure you ha are very organized. You do all these extra things at school. Usually people who are going for administrative jobs are overachievers. And so in the interview, you want to tell them every little thing and you want to make sure you get it all in and you want to be a success on everything. But sometimes things that you do are not as successful as you want them to be. And something that's very telling for me when I'm interviewing somebody is when the person says, well, it didn't yield the results we wanted, but we went back and looked at the data and we saw where we needed to adjust some things. We adjusted them, did it the following year, and it was a better result. Or we're planning on doing it the following year as um, with hopefully better results. So that's one way to kind of 
show that you did something. And even if it isn't a resounding success and everybody was perfect after that, um, which rarely happens, by the way, um, you can still use those skills with your leadership skills. It's called resiliency, right? So even when you fall on your face, you learn something to be applied later in your leadership so that you're better next time. So make sure you remember that in your interview. I love it when people tell me something failed and then they learned from it. I think that's really important. The other thing you want to be sure you remember is that this is an entry level position. You are not the superintendent of the schools. You are just beginning your journey as a leader. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, being an entry level here. Anything too extra is going to kind of come off as inauthentic. I've met with a lot of district leadership when talking about, you know, uh, leadership interviews and things like that. And the number one complaint I hear is that the person comes in with all the answers and wants to kind of run the show and be perfect in every way. When these leaders know that you are entering in an entry level position. And so you're not going to have all the answers. And finally, the third thing I want you to realize here is that it's okay to pause and think before you speak. And I say that to you because I have to often say that to me. I hate it when there's dead air in the room. It makes me very uncomfortable. I like to fill up the silence with the sound of my own voice. And that is not always a good thing because you ramble, you say too much, you know, whatever. So it's okay to take three seconds and think about what you're going to say. In fact, I find that to be very, very good when I'm interviewing somebody and they take a second to think. I feel like they're actually, you know, being methodical about their response. So definitely pause when you need to. That is okay. Don't sit there for 40 seconds. That's too long. But, you know, three to five seconds to think about what you've been asked is perfectly fine. All right, so I've taken a few questions that I've heard a lot in leadership interviews, and I want to just show you how you can pull from different experiences no matter what you've done. Because remember, you may have more experience than the, the other person, or you may have less experience than the other person. So let's just try to pull from wherever we can. So a question you might be asked is something like this. Tell us about a time you use data to make instructional decisions. What did you do and what was the outcome? Now be careful here. Your first instinct is going to be your classroom, right? Because you see, you hear instructional decisions. And of course, you're a leader. You use data to make instructional decisions. You've got that nailed. And you start rambling off how you use reading data to differentiate instruction and how you do this to do this. Well, that's all in your classroom. I want to hear outside the classroom at the building level or maybe even at the district level. So let me show you where you can kind of uh, do that. Now, the first thing obviously would be in your PLCs or your department meetings. And that is where you're working with other teachers, looking at data, classroom data together to make department level decisions. So that's very easy to do. Now, you may not have been the department head, you may not have been the PLC leader, but you still engaged in leadership because you were helping to disaggregate. Remember those keywords in the courses that you guys just bought? You disaggregated the data, you found where there was need, and as a department, and you helped lead the department, in making some of those instructional decisions. Right there is a really good way to show your entry level kind of leadership skills. Now, maybe you didn't lead the whole entire department at that time, but you can say, I helped lead or I led. It's okay, this is a leadership interview, right? We don't want you lying about your, your experience. Absolutely, do not lie. However, you're supposed to make yourself look good here, okay? So you can like, you know, beef it up a little bit. We're here to kind of lift ourselves up to make ourselves look better than the other person. So it's okay to say, you know, I made decisions that helped other students in other classes. And if we were to go back and fact check it, we could say, yes, she did. She, you know, made this decision and we used it in our classroom and that kind of thing. You may have um, participated in lesson study. That's also a way to be working with colleagues to make department level decisions or department level tweaks, things like that. So definitely think back into your PLCs. Now, another thing might be if you worked in discipline, I'm just gonna put ISS, the ISS room, right? One way I really like to see uh, people 
use their instructional decisions is for discipline. Um, because I don't like to see people just rely on discipline. I want those kids out of the ISS room and in their classroom, right? So maybe there was a time where you worked with a student who was in the ISS room or who had been kicked out of class and you worked with the teacher to get him back into the classroom or her back into the classroom. Maybe you pulled students' academic history when they were coming in to as you were processing referrals. So let me just give you an example. I was a discipline, you know, assistant principal. I was the hammer, so to speak. So the bad kids, bad, quote, bad kids would come to me. They were not bad. Uh, they would come to me and I would process their referrals. And the first thing I would do is pull their academic history and their attendance. And I was taught that by my principal because that tells you a story about what's going on with the student. So if you're pulling academic histories on all these kids, you're using data to make instructional decisions, right? Because you may see that this kid really needs to be in his reading class because his reading scores are low. So then maybe you work with the teacher to get the kid back in, whatever it is. Maybe you have the kid, instead of just sitting in the ISS room and sleeping, maybe you have um, the kid working on some reading strategies, things like that. Whatever it is, you can always turn discipline into instructional decisions. In fact, you want to do that. It should not just be the discipline room. It should be a way to help students rectify their behavior and then get back into the classroom because the students in the ISS room are the ones who need to be in the classroom, right? So that's another thing. Um, Another thing might be that you actually worked with um, the APC or the curriculum person. Okay, you may have worked in curriculum. You may have had the opportunity to look at the master schedule. You may be using, the data might be uh, scores, teacher scores, and maneuvering them in different areas. For example, maybe you had a reading teacher who had super high scores um, in on her reading uh, test. Maybe you want her to teach um, the, the, the students who need a lot of help. So maybe you, you and the curriculum principal or assistant principal help to move, you know, different teaching assignments around based on that data. All right. So that's a couple of different ways that you would use data to make instructional decisions outside of the classroom. Now, if these don't fit your experiences, just think about a time when you helped make building level decisions. This could be what professional development to do as a department based on what you guys need, based on your data. You know, everything's data. Observations are data. Test scores are data. Surveys are data. Maybe you surveyed the staff. Maybe you surveyed students. Maybe you looked through surveys and sorted them and figured out what, you know, the patterns and made instructional decisions that way. Just think about the variety of data that you've looked at and any way in which you helped contribute to overall instructional decisions for the building, for the whole entire school, okay? Don't default to classroom. Be careful. Now, remember, it asks here, what was the outcome? Don't fall short, okay? Now, you might say, all right, we use data in our PLCs to differentiate instruction as a department. We came back and evaluated the data and we saw that it was working. So we continued to use this in our PLCs throughout the year and we increased our scores as a department. Okay, good. Or maybe you use that, uh, you, you made some decisions and at first it wasn't really doing well and you went back and you looked at some more data and you could see whatever strategies you guys were doing weren't doing well, so you decided to change it up. And when you changed it up, it worked. Either way, make sure you look at the outcome. They're asking you, tell us about a time, and that's your situation, what did you do? But then you wanna make sure, what was the outcome? Was it good? Was it bad? What did you do about it? So make sure you do that. Maybe for the, um, you had a chance to work in the curriculum department with that assistant principal, you use data and you um, put teachers in certain roles based on their reading scores or based on their math scores, and maybe, at first, they were not happy with the new assignment. That happens a lot, right? Maybe you moved one woman from second grade to fifth grade and she was not happy, okay? Maybe you moved a fifth grade teacher to third grade because third grade is that you know high stakes year and he was not happy. Um, but you worked with that teacher to assure the teacher that he or she was needed there. Maybe you did some motivation stuff with the teacher or you you met weekly or monthly with the teacher just to help and it ended up being a great year something like that you know so you've got these peaks and valleys where you have the idea the idea kind of crashes and burns or the teachers are not super excited about it but you're able to you know regain some positive situations and then come out okay or maybe it was a bust 
but you learned and you went back and looked at the data and evaluated it further. All right, now there might be something like this. Tell us about a time you diffused conflict with either colleagues or students. What did you do and what was the outcome? Now, if you're working in discipline, you know for sure that talking to parents, you are diffusing conflict because some parents are going to be mad. Some parents are going to be like, whatever. Some parents are going to blame you and the teacher. Some parents are going to freak out on their kids. Um, so if you're working in discipline, you can definitely use that here. Um, maybe on a daily basis, as I was doing my internship in discipline, I had to call parents. I had to call, you know, guardians and had to convey the seriousness of what was happening, but also help them kind of come up with solutions. And I worked with them to let them know I'm here to support them, you know, supporting parents and things like that. And the outcome usually was I worked with the parents to support the parents and they were happy in the end or there were a couple times when parents were just angry and I couldn't I couldn't get them to to calm down you know and at that point I had to kind of defer to the principal that's good I I like to hear that too because if you can't handle the situation because it's getting too crazy your entry level you need to defer to the principal um you may also want to say something like I had another person present while I talked to this parent so maybe a parent had a Bad situation with a teacher, don't meet with the parent alone. Maybe you brought in um, a guidance counselor or another AP, or maybe you brought in the principal or somebody else. Um, maybe you talk to the teacher first. We always wanna to talk to the teacher first. So quick scenario. Let's say that um, a parent comes in and she's livid. She's angry at the teacher, right? Or she calls you and she's angry or she comes in. Well, you need time to investigate the situation. You can't just go down and start yelling at the teacher because a parent was upset. So if a parent's gonna be in the office, well, you can have the parent wait. Um, we're happy to call you in for a different meeting, but right now we're going to lunch and I have to do that, but I'm, I'm, I do wanna investigate your claims. So I'm gonna need some time to do that. I can contact you later. Um, the parent may not like that. The parent might say, well, I'm gonna stay here until it's figured out. Okay, then the parent can wait. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe you assure the parent that you're going to look into the situation. Your next step is to the teacher, not just taking the parent's word for it. You need to get all the information, right? And I've had times where the parent was completely bonkers and didn't know what she was talking about. And I've had times where the teacher was way out of line. So you're going to have different areas there. You can, you know, certainly talk about that in this question. And so when you're talking about conflict, you investigate or you listen or you kind of figure out what's going on. You don't just act. You kind of are figuring out the situation. You are having empathy for the other person. You're kind of putting yourself in his or her shoes to figure out what's going on. Why is the parent so upset? Why is the teacher so adamant about her decision? You know, you're, you're trying to be open-minded here. That's about conflict, being open-minded. And then, of course, the outcome. Well, what was it? Well, the parent, you know, uh, I talked with the parent, told her that I support the teacher's decision in this matter because it follows the school guidelines and follows the standards. And the, the parent was still very upset, but we were able to talk some things out and I was able to support the parent. That kind of thing. What was the outcome? The parent can still be mad. We're used to that. We know the parent is still going to be mad and hate your guts. That's okay. Or maybe it was the opposite. Maybe the teacher was wrong. And you were like, after investigating, I realized that the teacher had done something inappropriate and I was able to speak with the teacher with someone else present, or I documented the situation, something like that. And then I was able to talk to the teacher and tell, or talk to the parent, tell her it was handled, you know, whatever it is. But the first thing is when we think about conflict, we're listening, we're watching, we're investigating, we're asking questions to get an idea of what's going on. We're thinking about the other person's feelings and the other person's kind of interests and things like that. Why is this person so upset? Then we're evaluating what's my place, what can I do, what are the rules, what do the standards say, what does the code of ethics say, that kind of thing. And then, you know, going with the outcome there. So that's what you wanna do with conflict, all of those things. And finally, the last question you might see is something like this. Tell us about a time you worked with the community. What did you do and what was the outcome? So again, not for your class. Maybe you're a coach. Maybe school-wide fundraisers. School-wide, okay, fundraisers. Um, perhaps you were part of the SAC committee. Any kind of committee. Community committee. Make sure you're doing that. 
Um, it might be down at the district office. Maybe you're on cadre. Maybe you're, you were on a textbook selection committee. Think back to all of those things. Okay. Um, maybe you did something out in the community, like community cleanup, whatever it is, find those things where you worked with the community. It could be the outside school community at the district level or another school. It could be coaching events. Don't just go with, well, I was a coach, a baseball coach. Go with, I coached baseball and worked with other coaches in other schools all over the state. Because you're, if you're a good coach, you're working with all kinds of coaches all over the state. Um, we ran fundraisers. You know, that money went to um, our sport and other helped other sports as well. Um, I organized a huge golf tournament. We've had a couple coaches do that. Huge golf tournaments that generated tons of money. That's a huge leadership um, situation. So, you know, I had to organize vendors. I had to organize money. I had to organize parents. I had to get the kids on board. I had to organize time. I had to get it approved. All of that stuff is leadership. So very good. Um, if you're a teacher in terms of school-wide, maybe you did t-shirts or maybe you were a, um, a ninth grade sponsor. Maybe you were on the homecoming committee where you were in charge of the homecoming court. God, that can be a nightmare. So if you did that, hats off to you because that can be very, very sketchy. Um, maybe you are a cheerleading coach. You know, I always talk about the cheerleading coaches. You guys have to handle a lot um, and you're not given as much as all the other sports. So that's really good there. Um, just all kinds of organization in the community. Maybe you uh, got Target to get your kids a discount. Maybe you did backpack um, you know, where people donate backpacks and things like that, whatever it is, make sure you're talking about the community. And then what was the outcome? Well, we were able to raise so much money for the school, or maybe it's, we got the whole community out and people really got to know the school. Oh, another thing with community, um, open house. Maybe you helped organize some open house events, right? Not just your classroom, but maybe as a department or maybe as an intern or something like that. In your internship, you were able to organize the refreshments or something like that. That's all community-based um, interaction. So make sure you pull from there. All right. So I hope these three questions will help you on your interview. Remember, you want to pull from any situation you can and you want to have those in your mind. So you want to want to keep in mind, okay, what are my curriculum examples? So, okay, well, I worked in curriculum with the assistant principal or my PLCs, we were really focused on data and curriculum, or I worked downtown, you know, to select textbooks, kind of get two or three curriculum scenarios so you can apply those to whatever questions. Um, a community question for sure. You're going to want to think about a time where you worked with the community, try to get a couple of those in your head so it's not repetitive, you know, try to get two. And then um, the other one, conflict or diffusing, you know, situations like that. Try to figure out a way in which you were able to, you know, help in terms of a conflict or diffuse conflict, bring the temperature down. That's, that's the biggest part of our job is like, everybody calm down, right? So um, that'll really help you there. If you're going in for your leadership interview in the next couple days or weeks, good luck. Definitely rewatch this video or maybe listen to it on your way there. And let us know how you're doing in the comments. Let us know how things went. Also, if you have other things you'd like me to film, put those in the comments below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And be sure to tell your colleagues we're here and consider subscribing. Thank you so much and have an awesome day.